Courageous princess, fierce warrior, legendary superhero. More than four hours of awesome extras on Blu-ray and two-disc DVD. Wonder Woman. Own it on DVD March 3rd. PG-13. Parents strongly cautioned the violence throughout and some suggestive material. Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast. Jeff and Rick present Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Where we journey through each issue of comics that include a member of the most underrated Marvel series from the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adjacent adolescent adventure and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am Rick. Random banters. Transform and roll out. Random banter time, buddy. Talk to me. Tell me tall tales and tantalizing tidbits of trivia today. Look. You're not Optimus, and you're not Prime. You're more of a leader one, if I have to be honest with you. Kind of more of an Amazon free shipping kind of a guy, really. <laughs> Go bots, they're robots. <laughs> leader one's awesome. He's a jet plane. So uh, you're, you're, you're saying Transformers because we have a character that transforms. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Is that what I'm hearing from you? There's okay. a lot of explosions, and there is somebody who transforms. Yes. yes, yes. And, and in some sense, you might even say he actually does roll out, too. So there is that. Yes, because it's dealing with explosions and transformations and space battles and people from beyond the stars and aliens beyond our mortal kin. So, yep, that's why I picked that. It's a bit of a uh, Michael Bay movie going on here is what you're saying. Oh, my God. God, it's ridiculous. It is. They needed four colors in their ink arsenal for uh, coloring this one. And those are orange and teal, explosion color, which is orange, and then black and silver. Because that's heavy metal. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of explosions. It is the majority of this thing has just orange explosion coloration going on it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. But we will get into the comic here shortly. I, let's just talk about some things that have been going on. Mm hmm. Let's. Let's see here. I think that we're in the middle of a heat wave right now. We've been mostly staying indoors. And because it's the summer, I've been doing a lot of things, a whole bunch of tons of things. And I found out that being with like COVID and busy with work and then going on a camping trip, I didn't get around to my comic book store and I didn't pick up my comics for about three weeks. Ooh, so I went in there and I had a yeah. nice stack of comics. I know what that kind of pull list looks like. Yeah, it's big. It gets big. Yeah, it's like, yeah, this is how much you owe us. And I'm like, golly gosh, darn gee whiz. That's a <laughs> yeah. bit of money. Yeah. Gee, mister, could we not owe you that money? Yeah, it gets ridiculous when you start really. Yeah, when you start stacking those weeks of uh, pull lists on there and you're like, I got how much to read and it costs me <laughs> what? And you thought I'd like this one? That's a 10 buck comic? What? Yeah. I picked that up and then I heard from them a day or so later. And I was like, oh, okay, well, what what do you guys call me about? I picked up my comics and they're like, well, it's customer appreciation and we think you should come in to pick something up. And I was like, all right, well, I'll come back in. And I came in and I got me a free copy of the George Perez, Kurt, Kurt Busick, JLA and Avengers. And that was pretty darn awesome. I had already spent some money and picked it up myself, but I was like, okay, not a problem. This is probably going to be a high, because we're going to probably put this out a month from now or something like that. But I am going to probably, before one of our other shows that's going to come out before this one comes out, probably mention something about putting this book up online for an eBay auction. I'm hoping to do that. I'm hoping to put it up there with all of the donations, everything that's that's bid on this book and the final price of it, all going to the Hero Initiatives. I spent a chunk of money on the book myself. I'm yeah. not looking to cover it back, but this free book I got, I'm going to send it back out there and get some money from Hero Initiatives and donate that in our names. So That is really pretty impressive and amazing because I know how uh, sought after the release of that was. Yeah, yeah. So the, so. Fact, the fact that you, I know before on the drawing, you were one off from getting one of the four available copies. Yep. And now to have the customer appreciation one roll around and go in your favor, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. I'm pretty stoked about that. So, like I said, I'm probably going to put out some kind of announcement about what I just said 
in one of those shows that's come out before this, but I'm waiting for my friend who does a lot of work with the Heron Initiative to put up the eBay auction for me, and then he's going to help me get the book out there. So that's good. I'm excited about that. No, nah, that ought to pull some good cash for uh, Hero Initiative. And a quick editor's note, that auction has already been completed. Thank you if you bid. That's my thought. That's my thought. Yeah, it's a charity that we are part of, which is really nice. Yeah, yeah, we we do 10% of all the, of the money that people give us to do our podcast, we give that to here initiative. So, pretty happy about that. So, that's something. Yeah, it's something. <laughs> How about you? How you been doing? I've oh, been doing okay, uh surviving the heat because we have air conditioning and you know, been out working in the yard and everything, getting my big old sweat on. Like you, I did the shampoo camping trip with a whole bunch of geocachers and stuff. Mm-hmm. That was a lot of fun. Then had my daughter's fifth birthday party. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we 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 did the choo 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 train driving around, going around. Yeah, we did. We went to Shady Dell Train Park over in Malala, Oregon, which is just delightful. It's like five acres of train tracks and trains that people, you know, like volunteer engineers drive around and you, you sit on them and you ride around and you see it, you go, wow, this seems immensely dumb. I drive a car. This, why would this be fun? And then you get on these tiny little trains you can sit on. You're like, this is the best thing ever. I love it. And we ride around and ride around and then eat cake. So <laughs> these are absolute facts of things that happened and things that we did. And these make our little hearts happy. I think there's a perfect age. Small kids love this and old fogies like us like this. I think there's a, a excited middle section that probably is looking at us going, that's dumb. Yep. But we don't live in that age range at the moment, so we are okay. <laughs> yeah, it is very much smaller kid, older adult. Yes. The middle yes. ground might be a little kind of like, eh, I don't know about yeah. this, but you hit you hit those two spectrums and you're like, this is pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of fantastic, let's get onto this book. <laughs> Not the words I would use to describe it, but that's a spoiler for the future. <laughs> let's get on this train of Dark Hawk's future. <laughs> Jeff, two cents replay of last episode, please. Dark Hawk has left the loners behind and has restarted his life by moving back to New York to be with his family and to be security chief at Project Pegasus when an escaped inmate grabs his amulet, which makes Chris's perfect Jenga tower come tumbling down like a house of cards. Luckily for Chris, though, the loners didn't stay behind and all moved back to New York, too, so that he could go and ask them for help, so an angry Mickey near immediately forgives him basically goes out on a date with him, starts to get almost all smoochy with him, and then watches as another Darkhawk crashes into his backyard, and then also gets to watch as something else crashes into his family's house, causing a massive issue-ending explosion. Now that the Darkhawk tries to riff like Spider-Man in this book a lot, and it really doesn't work, two-sentence replay is over, why don't you give me a beer and tell us what our Power Pack pick is? My pleasure, my friend. Why don't you reach in that bag, and I will show you what I thought of the double dark hawks that we got going on here, all right? I will show you a beer. Reach into this paper bag. And I will pull out a can of Battlestar IPA from Crux Fermentation. They make some beers out in Bend. They're a company that we know well. And I got food poisoning one time. So let me just move on then, I guess. For Battlestar, our boundless (laughs) pursuit of the perfect IPA took us halfway around the globe before sending us straight out of the solar system in search of a supreme balance of hops, malt, and inspiration. Dry hop with galaxy and mosaic hops, the Galactic India Pale Ale delivers intense tropical and citrusy flavors suitable for faster-than-light travel, casual projection or just kicking it back with friends here on earth i think that is a perfect description of the book that we're about to read (laughs) yeah it really is this is a a fun looking can too it looks very battlestar galactica with its symbolism on there and kind of a green radar screen and some swirly do's of like little planety kind of uh, elliptic elliptical orbits but it looks it looks very much like battlestar galactica kind of gear in rainbow colors 7.8% 7.8% ABV and 65 IBU. I just felt like this was a good a good beer that would match up with what we're talking about. I, I saw this. I thought Battlestar. Yeah, two Darkhawk guys battling, going out to space together. That sounds about right. 
It smells really nice. It has the uh, good kind of sweet IPA notes to it. It pours with kind of a big foamy head. It's got a, a very nice, just generic beer coloration. Yeah, it's it's nice. A little hazy IPA color. It's not too bad, though. Not too bad. Very um, mild yeah. on the haze. It's like, it's like a core of mild haze, and the outside of it is... Very uh, trans translucent. Yeah, so. it, it's it is a beer color. It is a beer yep. color and citrusy, tropical. Yeah, that's about right. Not too heavy on the hop taste though. No, it has. It's a very dry beer because it made my yes. tongue kind of. You get that very grippy feeling on your tongue and the roof sure. of your mouth where it's like stripped off whatever natural oils you have or whatever. <laughs> but the taste is mild. It's refreshing. There's mm -hmm. a little bit of the IPA going for it. I'm getting the tropic citrus. There's a good balance of the hops and malt taste on it. It's good for a nice warm day. Which today is? A little behind the story. You mentioned going out to Shampooie. I brought a bunch of beer that I had in my fridge. I bought this as a four pack and I took the other two beers I had with it and they ended up out Shampooie. And I handed them to somebody and the guy was drinking. It's like, this is really good. And I was like, oh, let me see. Oh yeah, I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> <laughs> News to me, you say. News to me. And and I got to say, I I agree. This is tasty little beer. It's, it's light. It's tasty. It does have those tropical fruit notes without them being very cloying or overpowering. It's very much just kind of like a, hmm, there's a pleasant taste that's in there as well. What is that? Yeah. No, a nice little beer. And I think, uh, especially for this nice hot day. So I think we should dive right into this before possibly your daughter interrupts you again. So let's get to the opening credits, if you please. War of Kings, Darkhawk number two, May 2009, War of Kings. Credits, writer, C.B. Sabolsky, Dan Abnett, and Andy Lanning. Artists, Harvey Tullabau and Paulo Pantolina. Colorist, J. David Ramos and Rain Burrito. Letterer, VCs Russ Wooten. Production, Brandon Peterson. Assistant Editor, Michael Horowitz. Editor, Bill Roseman. Editor-in-Chief, Joe Casada. Publisher, Dan Buckley. Executive Producer, Alan Fine. Featuring Darkhawk, Mr. Chris Powell himself, and this guy named Talon. Guest starring Mickey, Darkhawk's family, and I guess the rest of the loners. Boom. 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 What are you doing besides blowing out my mic? Just reliving the explosion of Chris's house from last issue. Boom! Why, that was horrible. Dude's family is still inside. Hey, I know. I am not being insensitive, but I am trying to get into Chris's mindset. So, boom, boom. I'm the older son. Boom! My dad is dead. Boom! My brothers and mom are in a burning house. Boom! I am a young man with anger issues. Boom! I have an alien suit that brought this all on to me! Uh, oh, okay. So how are you feeling now? The roof! The roof! The roof is on fire! We don't need the water, let the water... Okay, okay. It seems like you went more rat boy and less superhero. How about we just stick to the text, alrighty? <sighs> <sighs> Fine. You never let me have any fun. Meh. Now, back in the comic, our boy Chris has navigated his own internal crisis and pulled it together to carefully dig through the burning wreckage to find his family. It looks like they are all alive and breathing-ish. Well, good for them. It seems like exploding houses and comics have the same survivability rate as crashing helicopters do in movies. So that is one crisis averted. But what hit the house, and who is this other Darkhawk? Well, we have answers to both. Talon, our new alien armored suited bestie friendy, informs Chris that a hunter drone was following him and crashed into the house. Ah, uh, so some alien who has similar powers and more knowledge of the suit has come to tell Chris to do something and has brought danger to his family in the process. <laughs> oh, this should go well. Insert Zram. Oh, also, the hunter drone is still alive and currently shooting at them. Terrific. Oh, and another piece of knowledge for you. Chris is apparently part of some interstellar social club. What, like the philanthropic and vigilant group of deer or something? More like a fraternity of raptors. A brotherhood of birds. There are some jokes that we can make here, right? 
No time for that, my little robin, so don't scramble your eggs. We need to flock together to take down this predator who smashed Chris's nest. After all, two raptors in hand should be able to take out one angry bird in the bush. I would be angry, but this hunter drone is no joke. Darkhawk zaps a monster, but it shakes it off like nothing and returns it in kind. Zram! But, and this is a big but. Teehee! <laughs> <sighs> By Odin, you're a child. After getting shot, the Darkhawk armor reconfigures itself into its 90s strife protocol with more silver and spiky bits. While Chris is befuddled by this, Talon is impressed that a reconfiguring has occurred. This means that the bonding between Chris and the amulet is better than originally thought. Now it is time to synergize their attacks to end this. First, Talon initiates transformation into their strike suit. You know, without getting shot at first. Then, they release a barrage of micro-missiles that seems to take off the protective level of paint of the drone. Okay. Cool. Now Chris lets loose some missiles which removes the primer level, which you really need to do if you want to strip the walls. Oh, I don't know. I think that it is better to just sell the house rather than to do any painting at all. But... That is besides the point. What has occurred in the story is a whole mess of anime-level missiles raining down on an overdrawn monster engulfed in a barrage of fire and color. Trash! Now that the monster, the block, and most of the local infrastructure has been destroyed, New Hawk tells Old Hawk that he is proud of him. This is about the point in time where Chris asks this new guy why he keeps calling him a designate. The answer is that, apparently, Chris is a novice a raptor in training. To put this into terms that any nerd from the 80s will understand, Chris is Ralph Hinckley, the Darkhawk gem is the red suit, and Talon is the instruction manual that Ralph lost in the desert in episode one. Believe it or not, uh, Talon starts to tell Chris what armor he is using and how it is responding to his emotions, and... And then Mickey breaks in to remind Chris that his family is injured. Injured. Hurt. At the hospital. Remember? Chris tells Talon to take a seat until he checks on his mom and brothers, and then they will talk. And we, the reader, at that point, will read. That is how comics work. Later in the hospital! Home in the fighting machines that go beep. Chris's mom seems to be out of surgery, but is still unconscious, and his brothers have been given hot chocolate. So Mickey and Chrissy have themselves time for a good old-fashioned argument. They're a special kind of couple. The crux of this out-of-nowhere fight for Mickey is that Chris has anger issues, and his attempts to control it do not seem to be working. There's always an excuse or a reason why he lets loose, but they are all just that. Excuses. She points out that the root of the problem is the Darkhawk armor. That is his problem. That is what is messing him up, and he just cannot give it up. Well, it does make him tough and powerful, and that is so cool. See, that's the problem. Mickey wants him to give it up or get help, you know, like from that Talon guy. And that sets Chris off, activating his armor and stating that it is Talon's fault his mom is in a coma. And if on cue, there is Talon, hovering right outside that very nice and breakable hospital window. In spite of Mickey yelling, no, 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 Chris attacks because he is, well, the worst. And attacking is how he deals with all of his issues. Talon does not take the bait. Instead, he tries to talk to Chris, informing him that he is just an angry little child. Oh, and also, the fraternity of raptors needs him, so you better learn that secret handshake and password. Chris don't care. He does not want this, but Talon needs help, and he knows how these suits work. Chris was never properly bonded, so the alien tech is, in fact, driving him insane. And with that, Talon punches the gem on Chris's chest, and a holographic message plays. Help me, Obi-Wan. You're our only hope. But No, no, after that message. We've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. No, 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 no. The message before that one. Well, it appears to be a mess of images that include some guys in Darkhawk armors. Black Bolt of the Inhumans, Lalandra from the Shi'ar Empire, the Kool-Aid Man, Blastar, Vulcan, Mr. Mixelplex, and a few spaceships. Look, I'm pretty sure you made up some of those names, but this is enough to make Chris sit down and take a listen. Those images, according to Talon, are cherry-picked to make Chris be impressed and to convince him to go on a little adventure. Well, sign me up. This raptor armor was not made for humans, and it is sending streams of information to Chris that he both can't comprehend and that are causing him to go, as we've said before, nutso. Oh, and there will be more hunter drones coming after him all the time now. Plus, he was supposed to change the oil in the suit after 750 bad guys. 
So the upshot is that Chris does not have any choice in the matter. The universe is calling and he does not have call blocking. Also, he has to learn how to use the suit to save his brain and also to go and save, well, everyone everywhere. That means he needs to say goodbye. And he starts with the loners. Back in the church basement. Hi, Chris. Chris apologizes to everyone for being an armored deranged lunatic all the time. Thanks, Chris. Big props to Johnny for asking how his mom is doing, though. That leads Chris into his reason for being here. He needs this group to watch his family. He became Darkhawk by chance, and there have been good and bad times. But now, he has to resolve some things. Basically, he needs to go to space to get the upgrade patch to make the armor work for him. And he needs to save the galaxy or something. It's all very odd. Just to make things awkward is Chris and Mickey having a very touching moment. Close. Sad. Touching moment. As she realizes he is leaving and he promises to come back for her. Yeah, the rest of the group, including Julie, just kind of become a giant third wheel on the worst last date of all time. Well, good news for everyone. We are about out of this story. Outside the church, Talon is waiting. So Chris armors on and he starts to get a history lesson. Okay, big picture. They are the architects of the universal fate. The raptor armor was made a long time ago by some guys in order to advance galactic culture. That seems, uh, vague. Well, these guys influence, adjust, shape, and improve. They are the curators of history and the custodians of the future. What is interesting is that they are tasked to do this, but I have not heard what moral compass they should be pointing towards. What is even worse is that the raptors have not been in operation for a millennia, give or take a century, which means that culture has been sliding out of control. Again, though, according to who? This all feels very cultish. Whatever it feels like, Chris is in like Flynn. This is part of his life. So sure, whatever. Let me be the light that shapes the darkness or, or you know, whatever. And good news, everyone. War is about to start. So suit up and get ready to learn, cowboy. Let's start by hanging out in the negative zone. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, can we not... Too bad you do not have a say in the story, buddy. And now, neither does Chris, because he just follows his new friend out into space, and poof, they are gone. Bye, Darkhawk. Have fun in the War of Kings Ascension. And goodbye, the loners. We are not really going to see you all together again. We will see a couple of members when we get around to Avengers Academy. But before then, we have one missed comic to pick up, and then it is on to check in on Alex and the two younger siblings with the Fantastic Four. But for now, let's talk about this issue, which includes the themes of this issue and the cover, which is drawn by Brandon Peterson. And um, I like this. This is a dark hawk being all glittery and metallic and there's flames and burn. It looks like he's stepping on burning lava and his suit is all kind of reflecting the red and he's got his wings down and they look all feathery. It's pretty kind of cool looking. Oh. It's neat. It's, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm going to assume it's the burning wreckage of his house, of oh, his yeah, childhood yeah. home, his yeah. memories and past loves lost to the licking flames. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, look, it looks neat, but also it's just, it's just the indicative of the color scheme in this where it's just like explosions and fire. Dark Hawk. <laughs> I think I would like this cover a lot more if the inside was just a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. It's it's a cool cover, but then on the inside, I'm like, oh, this is really just, this is it. This is what we're talking yeah, about pretty here. pretty much. Yeah. 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 There were, there were explosions. <laughs> there were explosions. So let's get into it. I guess we'll start off by saying goodbye, loners. Bye, loners. Julie did appear. Uh, she didn't say anything. She just sat there very angsty. She sure existed. She sure yeah, did she exist. Yeah, she sure existed. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, folks. We are going to be covering a lot of issues between here and our Patreon side that are all going to be like this. We are going to be covering issues that member of Power Pack takes a passing walk through. But that's okay. We get to talk about interesting comics. I enjoyed covering this. It may not be the best comic we ever do. It may not be the worst. But it was a comic that we read. <laughs> this is true. This is the universal truth. We have, in fact, read that comic. I will say I did like... I liked the loners being in here. I liked Chris saying goodbye to them. This was the last group that he was with. It, it was tying up some ends with them. It was also him saying, I'm going away. Right now, you guys are closest thing I've got to a family that I can trust. 
Yeah. Watch the superhero out my family. family outside. Yeah. Superhero family outside of his actual family, which he was living with, which he left at the hospital. But he's saying to them, can you please yeah. watch my family? So I which was good. That. I give him credits. For yeah. That. I give him a lot of credit for that. What's funny about the, the new loner group is that it is half of the members we know from before and about three fifths of them said nothing. The, the new loners are generic beefy man shapes that sit quietly and stare at you it's uh not a lot was done with the loners in this dark hot comic it was a nice goodbye i i really do wish that there was more interaction with the loners but we have a pretty tight story here i mean there's not much to this but it goes pretty straightforward a good chunk of this book is this beginning fight that we have and Darkhawk kind of figuring out that there's this guy, Talon, who is trying to help him. Uh, we have this big fight with this. Yeah, this hunter drone, which is ill-defined at best. It has three eyes and some explosions and like a beak and some explosions and I think some claws and some explosions. I, I would like to have seen this hunter drone. I think the hunter drone would have been very, very cool. But like you said, we get explosions. We get fire. We don't get the rain. We don't get James Taylor, but we do get this monster of a mech that's kind of covered in all this stuff, and we don't see it. We just get action, action, action. Yeah, we do know that it apparently hunts Darkhawks. Cool. It hunts the Fraternity of Raptor members, and that it's very dangerous on a one-on-one circumstance, apparently. There's not much that's told about it other than it's a hunter drone. Boy, it's tough. <laughs> Chris Chris is like, oh, wow, other me blew it up so good. That was so cool. It blew it up. Nope, it didn't. It's still shooting at us, and I got. Shot. I guess I got shot out of the air. It is hard to tell what is going on yeah, a I, lot of the time. We weren't kidding when we were talking about, here's a barrage of missiles. Okay, that took off the top level of paint. What's next? It just is one thing after another with this trying to get this thing to be destroyed. And that's... yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Problem with that was that it was not exciting. No. It was uh, just explosions. And talking about how, oh, it's shooting at me now. But I couldn't tell. I could not tell what was going on three quarters of the time. There were explosions, though. And apparently they sure did blow it up later with explosions. (laughs) What do you think about Talon? Here is his history so far. He is... One of the raptors. He's part of the fraternity of raptors, and he is an experienced amulet armor guy. And he had been in like cryo sleep or something for a millennia. He had been asleep, and he had just gotten woke up, and he discovered that, oh my, my fraternity doesn't exist anymore. I'm the last of my kind, except for ooh, what's this over here? A pleb, a newbie, some guy who got a hold of one of our suits who shouldn't have. Well, time to go team up with him and try and save his brain so that he can help me get the universe onto the course that it needs. Uh, he's, he's, uh, Talon is fine. He is another Dark Hawk, but a calmer doc, Dark Hawk because he knows how to work his suit and he can turn it into different things that I can't tell what they look like because uh, of the close ups of the art. Do we think that this is a good enough explanation about Chris and his armor? I mean, for now, is... I think, yeah, it's a fine explanation of why he's been having the problems he's been having. And it's not Chris's fault. It's the armor's fault. Oh, everybody should love me for who I am, not for what I do. It's the armor. But yeah, so yeah. I think yeah, it's, it's the mentor that comes out of nowhere is going to train... Chris up to a point where it's status quo, and then maybe he just flits off into the history of comics and is never seen of again, or he starts forming a new Raptor Legion. Let me ask you this. Would you be interested, would you ever have been interested in following the War of Kings storyline and seeing where this went? (laughs) Never heard of it, and I'm not interested even right now. I would would be willing to read. It would depend on how long it is. I'd be willing to read like a six-issue run to find out what the story is, but I'm not actively seeking out to figure it out if there is or to see what War of, uh, War of Ascension or War of Kings is uh, on Marvel Unlimited. <laughs> I never read this in the day. I've just kind of tried to pick up some stuff through some other reading. And let me tell you, it is a whole mess of cosmic stuff. The scrolls are involved. 
the Shi'er Empire is involved, Talon tricks Starcock into releasing uh, another member of the fraternity called Razor. And then we've got Emperor Vulcan, who, Emperor Vulcan, if you don't know, is another Summer's brother. He is uh, one of the brothers of, or he is a brother of Scott and Alex Summers, Cyclops and Havoc. So there you go. <laughs> well, I've seen him on the. Uh... I think he lives on the moon with yeah, 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 the yeah, summers. Yeah. And him and a bunch of gals spend their days drunk. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's- and their nights drunk. And then they spent some time in between passed out. And then they Vulcan's wake up. A, Vulcan is a thing. Vulcan is a thing. But mm-hmm. yeah, there is a lot of stuff here. Nova Corps is involved. Uh, there's a lot of things involved with this. It's. It might have been interesting. It might have been interesting to, to read at the time. I mean. You know, the choice is made. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it was an interesting turn for the Darkheart character. I, I like him being brought into the cosmic. He's been on Earth for a while. It makes sense that he's a cosmic figure. I think it's an interesting turn for the character. Yeah, it, it could be. Again, the problem that I had between uh, his fight with Talon is that we saw it with Goblin Hawk, where it's you take two armors and they have... The same defensive level, which is apparently better than their offensive level, so you just clang them together until you get bored of the fight. Yeah, it kind of seemed that way with the uh, Hunter drone as well, where it's just like, clang them together until you t- get tired of the fight, and then somebody goes away. But, yeah, yeah. He, he is more of a tank than an actual knife. So, yeah. you know, we don't get the, the fun jump and flitting around that Spider-Man would do. We get, hey, I'm going to crash into this until it breaks. Yeah, there never seems to be any, like, worry on his part of like getting hurt. It's just like, Oh, I got killed. I got hit with a planet kill beam. Ah, Oh no. I shot lasers at the thing. It didn't affect it. Then I got punched really hard. Well, I better get, you know, it's just like, it doesn't, it's clanging action figures together. Yeah. It's really what it seems like. Let's talk about this artwork though, because I think this is a big part of what this comic is. Mm. And we had Mm -hmm. comments on it last time. The beginning of this is just a lot of, Michael Bay Transformers, it's a lot of action. The animation is so thick, we can't see any detail. That's what we got going on here. And it is just a lot. I think that the artist is good. I just think that it is a lot. It's a lot. There's also the issue of, I would probably like the art if it wasn't cropped to 30%. Yeah. It is, we, we talked about this last time, the art is massively claustrophobic. Everything is way too tight in. It's high budget, low quality action film scenes where, oh, these people are having their big dramatic fight. And I saw a leg and an arm and there was a sword and then a gun. And I have no idea, but apparently that was supposed to be the cool fight. I cannot tell. I I understand conceptually what's going on in the comic, but I cannot tell what is happening. And in fact, the artist or inker or the letterer had that same problem in one spot where Chris and, and Talon are like talking to each other and Chris is trying to figure stuff out. And then it's supposed to be Talon that's answering and Chris is answering himself in the Talon voice. It's just <laughs> like, you made a mistake. The only difference between these suits is Chris has red eyes and Talon has blue eyes and you guys messed that up. Okay, cool. <laughs> But yeah, it's, uh, I would like to like the art, but I can't like it because it's so claustrophobic and just covered with explosions and overwrought, but under visualized. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess that's all I really need to say about that. I will point out one thing. I've got the actual comic here. And like last issue, we have a reprint of Darkhawk. We have Darkhawk number two. Now, Jeff, mm-hmm. you probably don't remember Darkhawk number two that well. I might own it, but I do not remember it. I'm going to paint a picture for you. It's 1991. We have the second issue of brand new comic book. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you two choices. Mm -hmm. There could be three people, but I'm going to give you two choices, two chances here to tell me who the guest star is on the cover of this book. (laughs) Oh, 91. Ooh, it's either going to be... Be Punisher or Wolverine? You needed the third choice, my friend. You needed oh, the third no. choice. It's not Cable, is it? Nope, nope. It is Sp- Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Okay. <laughs> you know what? Mentally, mentally, it was my very first choice. But then I started getting thrown with the era. And I'm like, oh, what I remember. It's just like, who are popular characters? Ghost Rider might have been another one to pump Ghost in Ghost Rider, it was, it was just a little early for Ghost Rider there. Yeah. Uh, my guess would have been Punisher. 
Spider-Man or Wolverine. I probably would put Wolverine third place because Wolverine just got sent in with a lot of things. But Dark Ox started off in the streets of New York. Punisher and, and Spider-Man, yeah. they would have been givens. But Spidey was my instinctive go-to. But I'm like, no, that's that's gonna it's uh, it's gonna they're gonna be trickier than that. And, <laughs> and they were not. I was too tricky. And not for only my that, own not only, we're we're doubling down. It's Hobgoblin's prey. So it's Spider-Man <laughs> and Hobgoblin. I mean, you know, 1991 Marvel by our book by our by, book <laughs> you want to see spider-man and hobgoblin fight again i know so do i, I so know. let's slap them on a cover and i'm gonna go for it <laughs> fun little game there all right let's go ahead and move to our final thoughts gallery of greatness what piece of art in this book needs to be pinned to our walls jeff give me some jokey jokey joke artwork that you found in this book my joke backup one is on marvel unlimited page 12 and I call it Awkwardly Placed Fast Response. And this is after they have defeated the uh, the drone. They're all talking and yelling at each other. And Chris's uh, uh, house, they're, they're basically circled by fast response teams. There's fire mm-hmm. trucks and police cars and ambulances and just stuff. And they're all circling them. And only one hose is going on the fire. And they all seem like they parked in a way that would just block their doors from opening. So it's just very awkwardly placed response teams that wanted to give the heroes enough room that they could talk, but not enough room that they wouldn't feel uncomfortable because they're being crouched upon. <laughs> yeah, let, let's 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 give everybody some room and park as far away from this as possible so, you know, we can go rescue people. I, yeah, it, it's, it's a little awkward. It's a cool looking picture, but it's a little on the awkward side there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. You're saying that uh, page 12 and mine, I had page 12, but apparently it's not page 12. uh, Apparently it's page, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm going Marvel Unlimited, whatever they say it is. Something like that. Anyways, this Mm -hmm. is uh, at the hospital, and I call this one care to step outside and this is talent outside of the window and dark hawk looking at him and going talon and oh yeah. no 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 says mickey it's fairly ridiculous it, it kind of reminds me of superman it's like you know superman looking in on zod care to step outside general zod <laughs> well here's the problem with talon right there is that he looks very almost like insultingly dominating in the flight pose where he's just standing there with his arms crossed yeah. It almost seems like he's trying to pick a fight with uh, Rage Machine Chris. I like Talon, but he's an arrogant little side. <laughs> so, he, yeah. he, but he doesn't know. He's not from Earth. He's not from around here. He doesn't know what his customs are. He thinks this is how he's supposed to talk to people. I'm not going to judge him. Anyways, what is your top joke one? My top joke one is on page 20. And uh, speaking of arms crossed, I call this one crossed arms, closed hearts, can't win. <laughs> And this is where Chris is at the uh, loner's headquarter basement church media meeting group. And he's talking to everybody and going, hi, I'm Chris Powell. I used to be the hero of Darkhawk, blah, blah, blah. And everybody there is just sitting, again, too close to him. And also all of them have, almost all of them have their arms crossed in a very kind of like, we're not going to listen to you and we don't want any part of this kind of thing. And it's just the least responsive support group that I've ever possibly seen in any kind of media. (laughs) No, I am going to disagree with you because Mm -hmm. I would like you to look one page further at my Mm -hmm. top joke one, which is called, so pizza later. This is where that (laughs) same group is sitting (laughs) quietly inside with their (laughs) heads down as the adults are outside the room saying goodbye to each other <laughs> they're not even outside of the room they're just off the circle of people who ha- again it's frustrating to see these people because it's just a not a very good support group because almost all of them have their arms crossed nobody seems to be paying attention to what's going on there's one dude who constantly has his phone that he's looking at and he's there with his arms crossed but he also has his phone and you can kind of tell he's like Hrumph, i don't want to have any part of this I better check uh, Reddit. Yeah, I want to look at. The, I want to see a panda fall down off of a off of a ladder, you know, or whatever. How are, how are the Mets doing tonight? Yeah, <laughs> it's just this is just a terrible support group where nobody talks unless they are Johnny gets a line in each time. Yeah, and then it's the Chris and Mickey show. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. All right, let's go to our backup best art. We like the art in this book. It's just. A lot, but there are yeah. some good pieces that are in here. So, what is your backup good art? My backup good art is on page 23, and I call it Activate Dove Powers. And this is the very bottom panel of the page, and it shows 
Chris and Talon talking, and they are uh, armored up and getting ready to start to fly into space, and we'll start in a place called the Negative Zone, and they're uh, surrounded by smoke and doves. Because lots of doves. Yeah, yeah. Darkhawk. Apparently, uh, John Woo directed this one. Lots of doves. <laughs> lots of doves. Lots of doves. Right above that is my top backup one, and I call it Talon Darkhawk. And I think it's a very mm-hmm. cool two scene. It's like they are talking together, and you've got half of Talon's face, and then Darkhawk responds, and it's his other half of his face, and it looks like one complete face. I like that. I like how the similarities and the differences of the two Darkhawk armors, you really see it in that that headshot right there. So I like that one. That's a good one. That's a good choice. What about you for your top one? It is on the very next page, which is the last page, page number 24. And I call it more doves <laughs> because more doves. Darkhawk and Talon are flying off into space, leaving their cloud of doves and smoke behind. And there's a really cool looking church that they're flying past yeah. with spires and a, like candle lit windows. And I thought that looked really pretty nice. Oh. So doves and churches and doves. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> All right. I would like to go back a bit. This is right before we have the giant hologram projector. And it is where we've got Talon just smacking Chris. And it's probably, it's kind of a good picture because it's reserved. It is Talon just belting Chris. And it is a, a good smack. You can actually see all of the characters. And I, I just like how there's rubble and we can see Chris's Darkhawk armor is starting to get kind of mangled and, and the, the wings are a little trashed. And it just felt good. I liked I liked how that, that scene worked. Yeah, that's cool. It's a good it's a good bit. Again, there's a lot of art in here that's pretty good looking or could be, and there's there was also a fair amount in here that was kind of funny. So yeah. Let's talk about the rubber and glue moments. What was the best or most childish insult in this book? On page 10, Talon starts off by telling Chris that he is, get ready for it, a novice. Ooh, 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 you're trying to be good to this guy. You're trying to be nice to this guy. But you know what? Calling somebody a novice, that's not very nice. Yep, that's uh, Marvel Unlimited page 11. And that is also my backup one. Which is, yeah, Talon telling him that is what you are, a designate, a novice, a raptor in training. Yeah, just not very nice. Not very nice no, at all. It, now, it's just it's just going, look, kid, you're a kid. Yeah, you're, and he follows that up. He follows it up a few pages later by telling him that he is nothing more of an but an angry child playing with toys that you do not understand. Yep, page 17. <laughs> On Marvel Unlimited. We're the same. Twinsies. Twinsies, I like, twinsies. I like Talon. He's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did love the fact he's just like, there was a part earlier where I think Mickey just calls Chris an idiot. You're yeah. an idiot. Yeah. Talon just, you're an angry child. Just, yeah. You're playing. Yeah. It's just like, you're, I'm he- yeah. I'm here to be your Yoda. You're an idiot. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just start at the basics. You know everything you think you know right now? Well, you know. you're an idiot. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me explain this to you in, in terms that you won't understand because Game of Thrones hasn't come out yet. Uh, you're Jon Snow and you know nothing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Pretty much. All right. We're on the exact same page on that. That's awesome. Then I should guess we should talk about popular and shunned. Who is the kid in this book? Who is the most popular and who's the most shunned? We always start with the worst, and I'm going to guess that we have the same worst because he is your favorite you worst. Might not. Do you I have think Chris? You're going to be surprised here. I do not have Chris. You don't have Chris. I had no, Chris. I, don't. I had Chris. I wanted Chris to be better. I think in the end he makes the right choices, but he takes him a bit of time to get there. It takes him a few different people and a few different smacks in the face before he finally realizes, why don't you shut up and listen to this guy? Why don't you shut up and take care of yourself? Why don't you just listen for a second? And it takes him a little while to get there. And I just, I kind of got a little annoyed with that after a while. I could see that. I thought Chris, for the most part, was handling himself quite well. I thought that he was keeping himself in check. He was keeping his eye on the big picture. He's like, my house is blown up. He's like, it doesn't matter about the house. It's the family that's inside. Are they okay? At the hospital, he's doing anger management techniques. He's doing stuff. So he was trying. He, you know, apologized to people. He was doing stuff, but he was also doing the standard Chris thing, where he was like, "I'm a raging jerk, and I'm gonna punch." <laughs> so yeah, I can understand why you pick Chris, but I did not pick him. Who did you pick? Mickey. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Go on. 
she seemed very unlike herself. In, in fact, the big thing that was the massive tip for me on her was they're at the hospital. She's coming in to tell Chris, it's just like, hey, you, you, I know your mom's still in a coma. I got your, your brothers some hot chocolate. They're fighting about marshmallows. I think they're pretty okay. What are you doing? He's like, I'm counting. It's like, why are you counting? It's, it's an anger management technique. It gives me a chance to separate myself from the situation so that I can process it and, and move forward with it. And then she's like, oh, fine. What are you going to do? Get angry at me now? He's like, what are you talking about? Fine. Be angry at me. I'm leaving. Blah, blah, blah. She's picking a massive fight with him for no understandable reason in a, in a time where it's like, I'm in the hospital with my family who's in the hospital. I, I'm disagreeing with that a little bit because she says, what county? She's interested in what it is. I'm raising that as interested. But his answer back was, it's an anger management technique. I did not see it that way. And then her set off was that, well, well, it's not really working now, is it? So You see, I, I didn't see it as that. I saw it as he's, you know, she's like, what? Counting? And he's like, yeah, it's a technique. I, I saw it as him being more calm and the anger management technique functions were working where she was exploding and it seemed like for no reason. So she's just riling him up, storming out, talking about just like, you're an addict on your armor. And he's like, no, you know that I'm bonded to it and I can't unbond from it. It's not that I'm addicted to it. It's I, I have See, and, hooks in my skin. And it's interesting because my best in this was Mickey because I was hmm. reading it as she was reacting back to him. He was like trying to do this this technique she's asking about. And he's like, it's my technique. And well, it's not working now, is it? So I was reading it. I was reading a different way just with how some of the bolding of the words were and some of the her responses in the pictures of this, which may, there may be some difference in how some of that comes across between the print and the digital. Well, potentially, because I don't recall seeing any like bolding or anything of the lettering. Of oh, it. I saw, interesting. So, and normally for me, I am more than willing to not give Chris the benefit of the doubt. And I want to give <laughs> Mickey the benefit of the doubt. So when I was like, you know, I really did not care for Mickey in this. It was a surprise to me. And so it's interesting to see that your take on the exact scene that was made me formulate an opinion is the exact opposite. So yeah, that's I'm, interesting to me to see that we both read the exact same thing, saw the same pictures and came up with entirely different conclusions. Yeah. I am kind of curious now and I'm trying to get myself to Marvel and limited. Just take a look at that, at how it looks online to see if there is that change in, in the way that it is set up. Yeah. I, I do see what you're talking about. Cause if she goes like it for the bolding of it, it's like, she goes, what counting? And he goes, it's an anger management technique. The therapist explained to me, I count, and it gives me a moment to calm down. So it's... Yeah, and, and the way that she's saying when what counting, she's she looks kind of timid there. She's like, she's asking a question. And then his look on his face is more is more intense and more angry. And it's like, he is... It, I read it as he is snapping at her when she's asking an innocent question. And then... Yeah, and then it goes downhill. I can see that, but I can also see it the other way. So it, I think it is very open to interpretation. Who is your best one in this one? Johnny. <laughs> I know why. I know why. Yeah. He asked about mom. I almost yeah. picked Johnny for that same reason. Johnny asked a simple question. How's your mom doing? Yeah, it's like, oh, she's she's fine. She's in yeah. the hospital. Yeah. Thanks. You know, so, but it seemed like he was the only one that didn't have any negatives dragging him down. Yeah. He was curious about family members' well-being. Yeah. So I picked Johnny. Done. No. You, fi you figured out exactly why. Done. No. I think that's perfectly fine. I think that's perfectly fine. I think that we need to grade this book. We need to put this against the rest of the issues that we have on our list. Now, that starts off with Wolverine and Katie being hunted in Uncanny X-Men Volume 1, number 205, by the recently Eisner Award winner, Barry Windsor Smith comic. Going down from that, we have... Number 10, Runaways, Volume 2, Number 1. Going down the bottom spot, we've got Loners, Volume Number 1, Number 3. That's where Julie is in the hospital, and everyone finds out nothing. So, Jeff, mm. I know you're not a fan of this book. Mm -mm. How much do you not like this book? Please tell me, sir. So how far in the bottom are you willing to dip? Tell me where you won. I do not think that it is the bottom issue. In no way is it usurping Drama Hospital's non-communication fest. Well, let's talk about the end of Mickey and Chris's relationship. Not in this mm -hmm. book, but let's talk about the one above it, which is Loner's number five. And that's Phil losing it because of Mickey and Chris's relationship. That's in the midst of their relationship. This is, seems like the total end of the relationship. Did you like that one a little bit more than this one? That one, 
I have to now remember. I have to use my brain to think about it. They're very similar because six is very similar because, you know, everybody gets mad at Phil and everybody leaves. Uh, lots. It's similar in the sense of there was a lot of punch, punch, kick, kick, punch, punch, explosion, explosion, punch, punch, mm-hmm. punch, 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 ad nauseum until they go. Oh, we should talk for a little bit. We're all separating and leaving. I think that this can go in between those two. I think that this. I think it could too. I think that. It could that, go 14. Yeah, I think that there's still a lot of problems with loners number five. I think that mm-hmm. this is a bit better than that. So we'll make this the new number 14. Sounds good. Sounds very good. That's where that slaps down at. All right, all right, all right. So that brings us to our beer. Jeff, tell me. What did you think about this beer? I've been drinking it. I've found several times where I'm like, ooh, Chris, Rick is talking. It's my turn to have a little drink. Darn it, it's my turn again. I go, okay, sip, sip, sip. Okay, here we go. I'm enjoying it. It is a very light beer. It has got a fairly nice flavor to it. The aftertaste is not insulting at all. The front taste is not insulting at all. It is a very, it's what I would consider to be a very mild IPA with some nice, tropical flavors to it or uh, tropical adjacent flavors it's good i enjoy it it's great on a hot day like today i wish my beer was a little bit colder but it's a good three five four i'm gonna go four yeah i think i'm gonna join you on that four island there this is a good beer uh the hops has stayed away and not come out to play too much it's tropical tasting like you said nice and refreshing and it fits in on a day like today so uh two fours from us for mm. crux fermentation project Battlestar IPA. Mm-hmm. And now, since we were speaking of fours, it's time for Kids Perspective. And that is where we ask Rick's daughter, Carrie, about the premise of the book that we just read. And so, Rick and Carrie, please take it away. Hello, Carrie. Hello, Daddy. So we are back to talk about War of Kings, Darkhawk, number two, two. Yeah. And we, last we left off, Chris's house exploded because there was this villain that showed up, right? Yeah, Bl- a.k.a. Blue Darkhawk. Yes, yes, yes. Well, he's not a villain. I guess we got a new character. Yeah. He's a person with armor on. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about him. What do you think of Talon? Do you like him? Do you not like him? What do you... I mean, from what you know right now... What do you think? He's average? I don't know. He's kind of plain. I mean, he and Darkhawk are fighting, and that's really all we see with his appearances, him and Darkhawk fighting, and then he tells Darkhawk something. He's trying to give him information, right? He's trying to tell him that he is part of something <sighs> bigger. And, you know, mm-hmm. if you can, if you would stop fighting and listen, I can help train you and i can help tell you what's going on right yeah which is kind of nice of him considering Darkhawk just wants to like kill him but <laughs> <laughs> what did you find out about Darkhawk's armor what did you learn by reading what talon was telling him the work of the raptors yeah they, they, <laughs> they are known as the raptors and the like some brotherhood of of raptors yeah and why is Chris having problems with his suit? Apparently, it wasn't intended for him, so it was probably meant for someone else. Yeah, it's, it wasn't meant for a human being. He never got any training. It wasn't properly bonded with him. There's a lot of reasons why this suit is kind of working against him and causing him to be so angry. Yeah. Talon wants to take him out and teach him and, and help him learn how this all works. Wait, does... That mean Talon is probably not a human either? Probably not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He came from space. Do you <laughs> so, think that... I mean, humans can come from space. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, it, it is a, a good assumption to make that this is not going to be a human being. Yeah. It's a living being. This is true. This is very true. Do you agree with Chris's choice that he should leave and go with Talon? Do you think that's a good idea? Probably. I mean, apparently the raptors need help. And the raptors are the one who built the suit, so... And apparently he's really attached to his suit, so he probably should go if he's fond of it. And the raptors are the ones who made it. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know! Eh. I wouldn't because I'm still suspicious of Talon, but... Well, that's actually a good thing, too. I mean, (laughs) I think that you should be a little suspicious of Talon. You don't know if you're getting all the information, so... When I see Talon, I would say... I would shout stranger danger and probably run away because I don't want to get in a fight yet. 
True. And you should say stranger danger if you see somebody dressed like Talon. I I would say stranger danger if I saw somebody dressed like Talon. And I would run away and probably call the cops that someone was trying to take me to outer space. So (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I would have gone, but apparently Darkhawk's very fond of his suit and maybe he has a reason to go. I (laughs) guess. Let me ask you some more about the art. We have more big fights in here, and they they're a lot, aren't they? Yeah, we start off really red. A lot of fire, a lot of moving parts. Explosions. Electricity. <laughs> Did you like it? Did you not like it? It was a little too much for my eyes for, for a <laughs> while. It was just really overwhelming i couldn't tell what was going on anymore i had to like try and focus on the words and then the words were just people shouting at each other and eventually when it calmed down it was like the same as last time you know didn't love it didn't hate it so it just was it was just yeah it just was something it was a thing okay all (laughs) right we also saw the Kind of one of the last times we're going to see loners together. And they all kind of said, goodbye, Chris. And do you have anything you want to talk about about that scene with them? No. <laughs> I don't know what to say about it much. It's just... Johnny asked how his mom was doing, right? Yeah, that was really nice. And then yeah. it was... And then they said goodbye to him. Yeah, it was like a, almost a complete change of subject, though. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but th- they also showed that they cared and that they would help protect his family while he was gone, right? Yeah, which was yeah. very nice, and then Mickey and him hugged, even though Mickey seems like she's really mad at him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they kind of have to do it. It's end scene, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, that's them. <laughs> All right. And Julie just sits there staring at her nails or something. All right. Anything else you want to say? No, except... Now that I think about it, I'd probably be the Julie in the group. I would just sit there, like, look at my nails, like, ooh, this one's sharp. I should probably, like, try and trim that first before, like, anything so, else. So what you're saying is that you, your friend's telling you that you're, he's going to leave for outer space and that he needs help with his parent, you know, make sure his family is safe, and you're going to spend your entire time just staring at your nails? <laughs> you're a horrible friend. Horrible friend. I've raised a horrible friend for a daughter. Wow. <laughs> I mean, gosh, we got to work on that. We got to work on that. I probably would do a little bit with like, okay, I'll try my best to look after your mom. But I also do care about those nails. It does hurt when they snack. <laughs> so do you want to read more of this uh, Darkhawk stuff? Or are you done with him? I'm kind of done with him. but okay. uh, So is Jeff. So is Jeff. So we'll move on to something else now. We'll move on to something else. Oh, all right. okay. That's all I have for you, Carrie. Thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, welcome. Love you. Love you, too. Ah, excellent. There were a lot of explosions. You're right. A lot of explosions. Shadow time. We'd like to recognize those listeners that take the time to write in or leave us a review. And this is for episode 112. Can you believe it? Where we covered the Marvel Holiday Special from 2007, Secret Santa. Al Sedano and his podcast, Resurrections, and Adam Warlock and Thanos Podcast. 808 Comic Book Fan. Chad Michael Simon. Chris at BTO and Bat Books. Clinton Robeson and his podcasts, Coughing and Comics, and Fan Film Fridays. Craig McNichol. Dear Watchers. Hillary Trezenka. Who? Uh, some, some gal who doesn't listen to the show. Ah, okay. <laughs> She's got a lot of consonants in her last name. Anyways. Yep. Hoover Jeremiah and his podcast, Four Million Years Later. Jake Shear. Jeff Bullier. Jeremy Duh. Kathy Bright, the MVP. Matthew Birdsey. Mia Wallace. I know her. Tim Price, the Podcrasher, and his podcast, The Outcasters. Waffles, the Waffly Waffle, and his podcast, Waffles and Mario, Talk About Things. We also love to thank our Patreon members. They give us money, which we donate a little bit to Heroes Initiative, and it helps keep us in our beers and in our podcasting. Adorably astonishing and amazing Andrew Burns. Cheerfully cheeky and charming Char Logan. Challenging cheesy and chuckling Charles Gears. Destructive and devastatingly delightful Damian Witter. 
dynamically dangerous and devious Doug Jones. Exciting, energetic, and entertaining Edward Verrocci. Intelligent, interesting, and innovative Isaac Perry. Jesting, joking, and jovial Jeff Polier. Just, jealous, and jewel Jeremy Daw. Muscly, mighty, and meticulous Matthew Birdsey. Mythical and magnificent monologuing Matthew Laserwitz. Rudely rhyming and running Rustin Fritcher. Steely, salty, and steamy Sailor Bear Zodar. Sad and sickeningly silly Shag Matthews. Strange and stirringly steady Stephen Gray. Tyrannically terrifying and tame Tim Price. Technically terrific and triumphant Toddy Knock. Way, way wordy and wobbly waffles. Weird and wonderfully wacky Wind. Next issue, we are going to go back in time and cover Wolverine, Volume 2, issue number 37. Since we're going to cover everything, I realized we missed this one. But that will bring us back into one of our favorite issues, Uncanny X-Men number 205. And additionally, we are going to cover New Warriors Annual 1, because there's another little story that I missed. A big thank you to Jared Ulbrich from the Longbox Crusade Network, who managed to trip over this during his coverage of New Warriors. And be sure to check out the other shows that we are on, including my lovely monthly Monday movie muckabout on the Longbox Crusade Network. And we have some merchandise available on Redbubble. Go to redbubble.com and search for Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Jeff and Present is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in front of a live studio audience of my Superman earring. If you would like to interact with us through the magic of the internet, you can do so through Twitter at Jeff and Rick Present, our Facebook page, Jeff and Rick Present, our email address, Jeff and Rick Present, all one word at gmail.com or at our website, Jeff and Rick Present dot WordPress dot com. Also, our YouTube channel is at Jeff and Rick Present. And if you would like to help support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com Jeff and Rick Present, all one word. We are also a proud supporter of the Hero Initiative, and we'll be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to heroinitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us wherever you can. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs. My wife, Cindy, and our daughter, Carrie. My fiance, Hillary, and our daughter, Aurora. We We love love you. you. Until next time. Costumes costumes off. off. Our theme music is 80s action. Also featured in this episode is World of War by Sasha End. All music is by Kevin McLeod at Acoptech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. Yeah. Three, two, one, go. (laughs) Zram! After getting shot, the Darkhawk armor reconfigures itself into its 90s strife protocol... After getting shot... (sighs) Everything is terrible. I'm awful at this. At least you know. No, I'm not. I'm great at it. I'm going to get it this time. Bye, Odin. You're a child. Zram! Here, let me get to the end. God, that's a lot of explosions. It is very Michael Bay. It's very Michael Bay. It's just nonsensical and explosions. Okay. Zram! And that's where we asked the premise of the book to Rick's... I forgot how old she was. Eleven. Eleven. Doesn't matter. Zram! Tim Price and the Podcrasher. That's right. No, that's all entirely wrong. Tom Priz. No.